Mr. Malema, welcome to Unfiltered. Bah, thank you. Thank you very much. You recently said in a press conference that South Africa could be plunged into darkness for a month, two weeks. What evidence did you have for that claim? Well, uh, as a leader of the opposition and uh, as a revolutionary, you have to be an advanced detachment of your society and always be ahead. So I know for a fact that there was an exchange between FBI and our secret service here at home where information was given that we are likely to have a grid collapse in the next two weeks. So as we speak about stage eight and all of that, once you go stage eight, stage 10, effectively there is no longer electricity. And uh, I had that in good authority and it didn't take two weeks. Already they are telling you, prepare yourself for stage eight. They are preparing you for dark days. So just to clarify, the FBI had communications with, with South African our, authorities? With uh, intelligence here at home. They, and the, the problem is that the ANC politicians want to act business as usual, want to act like there's no crisis coming. There's a big problem coming. There's no one who shows the sense of agency. There's no one who shows some concerns. And this information was given to them. But you also said that this could happen within two weeks. Yes. And if it doesn't happen in two weeks, that might be seen as scaremongering or fearmongering, or trying to whip up people's fear in this very difficult time of load shedding, which is already hard enough. There's no fear. You are, you are told of stage eight. What is fear about that? You are on stage six. I told you we are heading for worst situation. In less than 48 hours, they came to tell you, prepare yourself for stage eight. What happens after stage eight? Is there stage 10? Should we continue to call them stages or should just declare crisis and say, we're back to the dark days? Because stage six alone, it's a nightmare. Imagine stage eight and stage 10. So there's no scaremongering. I've already, they've already proven me right that the crisis is ahead of us as confirmed it today. So I was not scaring anyone. I was just saying to the country, please be aware we are heading to a crisis. The president doesn't show the sense of agency. The ministers don't show a sense of agency. No one takes us into confidence as to what is really happening in this country. I think your, your exact statement was that in the next two weeks, we're heading into darkness. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you confident of your information on that? Stage eight now, that is not lightness, it's darkness. But it was for a month or we're going into darkness for two weeks at a time. No, no, not two weeks, not two weeks at a time. I'm saying the crisis is going to worsen in the next two weeks. It has already begun with the statement that was issued today that we are now going to stage eight. There will not be stage six after stage eight. It has to be stage 10 or darkness completely. And that has been confirmed. So I told you in the press conference, less than 48 hours or so, they came back to say, please ready yourself for worse situation. And that's what I was warning about. One of the other things that you said in the press conference... Is, is, I've never has... said anything that has never come to pass, by the way. Oh, well, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, one of the things you did say uh, was that in a few weeks, um, after all that's happened with load shedding, you think that certain people who've been involved in ESCOM before, and you said a wide range of people, to yes. be fair, yes. to, to look at that statement, but one of the people you said should, quote, come back is former ESCOM CEO, Brian Molefe. Mm. Now, Brian Molefe is facing charges, serious charges of corruption. The state capture inquiry and the state capture report leveled serious, at least suspicions over his head. Why would we want Brian Molefe to come back, quote, unquote? What did the State Capture Commission say on Brian? It didn't say anything. It said it recommends further investigation. Tulima Donzella said there must be a commission to investigate Brian. The commission comes and says there must be another investigation on Brian. The charges that Brian is confronted with are the charges of uh, uh, Transnet. Have got nothing to do with ESCOM. I'm not saying the charges must be dropped. I'm not saying he's innocent. All I'm saying is we are in a crisis and any help 
must be welcomed. We shouldn't push people away who can help us. I spoke about former CEO of ESCO Maroja. I spoke about Coco. I, and I made a call that everyone who can help us come out of this. I didn't say they must employ them back. I said, when you're confronted with a situation like this, you call out on all patriots to come without being partisan, to come and help us uh, with this problem. So Brian, um, he must be investigated. If there are serious allegations of corruption against him, go on with that. But here is an elephant in the room. We've got an immediate crisis which has got a potential to collapse this country. Imagine if the grid collapses. There will be no network of cell phones. There will be no water because water must be pumped. There won't be anything functional. So as we proceed with whatever we're proceeding with against Coco and Brian and whoever, can they be patriotic enough to come and help us with this project? And that has got nothing to do with their charges. And I've made that very clear. So I didn't suggest that the State Capture Commission found yeah. anything. I said it, it raised suspicions. Yes. But Molefe is facing charges. So the NPA at least has brought a case against him. We don't know which way that will go until mm -hmm. the court pronounces. But those suspicions even existed before the State Capture Commission, yes. they existed before, yes. uh, before this case. And, and you know, and you he said arrest them. You, yeah. you said uh, of Brian Mulefe at a speech in Joubert Park in 2017, you steal money, you want to collapse the only institution that gives poor black South Africans electricity, but, and thereby undermining, I quote again, the black majority. Mm. So it wasn't the State Capture Commission or the court which undermined Brian Molefe's credibility. It was actually you. I'm saying to you, if Brian can help, if Coco can help, if Maroa can help, let everyone come and help us because we are in a crisis. To be dwelling on who said what will not bring light to this country. All we want now is the solution to this problem. But the... the the charges that Brian is facing, it doesn't make him guilty. Brian, in the eyes of the law, he's like me and you. He's innocent until proven otherwise. So if Brian can be the solution, uh, let Brian come and help us. If he has got no skill, no problem. Let's go look for people who can come and help us. We went fetching people who had no idea whatsoever and put us in a more crisis we find ourselves in now no to be sure and i think innocent yeah. until proven guilty is yeah. a fair point i think certainly no one is uh carrying water for mr director yeah. and and what has happened there at escom but i think it is a bit confusing for people when on the one hand you have said mr mulef has collapsed escom intentionally and now you think he's capable of saving escom don't you think there's which one do you think people should believe? When you are in a crisis, you call for any help you can get. And I've not said Brian single-handedly can resolve that problem. I said call everyone with the necessary skill and qualification to come and help us at ESCOM, including Brian. But because we want to enjoy the negativity, we stick to Brian. You leave all the other names that I've said must come and make the intervention. So what we need to stick with now is switching on the lights. Can Brian and others who were there before come and help us to switch on the lights? If the answer is yes, let them come and switch on the lights. And I suppose and the, that's what we should stick with. And I suppose the question is, what did you mean by come back? Because in the media, no, no, no. I suppose- I even said it very clear. Yeah. Yeah. It must be a, such an intervention that comes out of a patriotism uh, to an extent that it should not even include money. Ideas must now come together and say, guys, this is where uh, we can find a, a solution. This is what we think can be done. We have dealt with this problem before. Uh, that's why I didn't speak about rehiring Brian to replace the writer. I, I said... Is if it was for me, 
as a president of the country, I would have reached out for any necessary skill to come and help us. So ma material condition at all times determine the posture you take uh, in politics. And now conditions demands that any engineer, anyone with the necessary skill should come and help us switch on the lights. We're in conversation with the president of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Mr. Julius Malema. Make sure to keep the conversation going with the special hashtag for tonight, Malema on Unfiltered. And we'll be back with more of this conversation after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. I'm in conversation with President of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Julius Malema. Mr. Malema, you also said in your recent press conference that you thought the U.S. ambassador should have packed his bags and gone the day after he made those allegations about weapons transfers to Russia. Do you still stand by well, that, uh, that statement? That the, his credentials should have been withdrawn with immediate effect. Look at what he did to our currency. Look at the uh, uh, damage he did to the good, beautiful image of our country. Uh, despite all the channels that are there, West America can access anyone they want to access in this country. He takes a post he has taken, uh, uh, discrediting our country to a point where I like Minister of Defense, for example, that we have not transferred anything, uh, even the smallest to the size of chappies, has never been sent to Russia. So why would someone just, in a diplomatic uh, engagement, take such a posture against our country? And many people, have, that. many people have criticized the U.S. ambassador's statements, yeah. but you went one step further and said that it would actually be good if we gave weapons to Russia. Yes. Don't you think that is not just veering towards non-alignment, but actually active participation in I'm support not, for I'm, Russia. We are not non-alignment. Uh, what, what is non-alignment? Was Russia non-alignment during apartheid? Russia gave us guns. So did Ukraine. No, we agree, but our ally in the battle uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia, it's Russia. And uh, why would we want to give weapons to Ukraine? Why would we want to be non-aligned uh, non -aligned? Uh, uh, when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, when we say our political and historical ally has always been Russia. So they never became neutral. They've been with us. They trained most of our uh, leaders today in their universities, in the military, and then equipped us. So anything that seeks to take a posture against the USA were aligned to it. So let's, let's delve into the historical narrative because Russia and the Soviet Union aren't necessarily one and the same yes. thing. So it's correct to say the Soviet Union was our ally, but the Russian Federation which succeeded the Soviet Union is quite a difficult, uh, a different political entity, a capitalist state in many ways filled with great capitalist exploitation. Uh, from which President Putin himself has benefited. Mm -hmm. Ukraine could just as easily historically, in fact, sometimes more in terms of the training of MK combatants, MK leaders, stake a claim, historical claim to South Africa's allegiance. So why do we pledge allegiance to this new political entity, which is not identical with the Soviet Union itself? No, the Soviet Union, played an important role in solidarity with South Africa, but Russia in particular. So we are not confused about the role that was played by the Soviet Union. And that the Soviet Union trained a lot of our cadres. But Russia itself played in that context of the Soviet Union more significant important role. A lot of ministers, we can call their names today, learned for free in the universities of Russia. Many of ministers who can quote their names and leaders today were trained in Russia and were not confusing Russia with the Soviet Union. We know the difference. And we know that Russia, as is now, it's a capitalist state. But anything that seeks to create 
an alternative to the USA. It's an ally to the EFF. A capitalist in nature, but it has taken a posture to take head on in alliance with China, a socialist state to take on the imperialism and to take the USA directly. But I think and that, for us, <coughs> is what makes Russia in this context more some, strategic. Some would say that's, that's too clear or that that's too much of a, a dichotomy that you're drawing there between if you're against NATO, if you're against the West, yes. then you must be supported. Isn't it possible to, in the tradition of many revolutionary African leaders, to say, as in the case of the Cold War and the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, we're not in the Western Bloc, nor are we going to support acts of war and aggression that come from the alternative Bloc. We're going to create our own path in international relations, because otherwise one falls victim to the claim that you're a lapdog for Russian interests, instead of having your own position on these questions. No, we are an anti-imperialist organization. And anything that takes head on imperialism, we aligned with it. We are not a Russian lapdog. Um, we, we have to uh, create a both tactical and strategic allies internationally if we want to attain a socialism as a system that should operate uh, worldwide. We cannot operate in isolation. And that's why you see the Communist Party of China not having a difficulty to align uh, with Russia, knowing very well that Russia and Putin is a capitalist system and Putin is a beneficiary of such a system. But in the, in the international politics, they've taken a correct posture. And that posture is what we are uh, as the EFF. But do you denounce Russian aggression? Do you find anything wrong with the fact that Russia intervened directly in Ukraine, went to war in contravention of the UN Charter? Do you my denounce guy, that? My guy, we're with Russia. We're not denouncing Russia. And we'll give it weapons if we're a state. There's no confusion about that. Well, the, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights says that 24,000 not combatants, civilians, have died in Ukraine. And the majority of these civilians, some of whom are children, about a thousand, have died under the consequences of bombing and explosions. So the, the question is not necessarily one of just geopolitics. It's also a moral question about the loss of innocent life to the tune of 24,000 people. And, and that matters, doesn't it? It does, but there will always be casualties in war, especially when the leadership of your country doesn't take into consideration the interest of that particular country and pursue the West, NATO, American-aligned interest at the cost of their own uh, country and their own uh, uh, civilians. I mean, this matter would have been resolved if Ukraine would not have allowed its expansion. So it, they, 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 we are very sympathetic um, uh, to civilians who lost life, and uh, we will not be proud of such. But unfortunately, my guy, it's a war, and there will be casualties. It is what it is. There are also geopolitical consequences for South Africa because the more we push towards Russia, and if we were to follow your policy, I, I take it if you were in charge of South Africa's foreign policy, you yes. would be pushing a pro-Russian alignment Absolutely. stance. Yes. That would have major real consequences for the South African economy, also geopolitically. If we just look at what's happening in the UN, South Africa's recent decision to abstain mm -hmm. on a motion left us isolated where three quarters of the world supported that motion, including many African states, many states from the global south. Wouldn't it just be practically foolhardy for us to follow a pro-Russian stance when our economy and our geopolitical standing could be called into question? Well, uh, there are consequences for any political decision you take. Uh, the implications will be there economically. Do we have alternatives? And that's what 
uh, this uh, uh, type of posture that has been taken by Russia as uh, seeks to create an alternative platform where we are not reliant entirely on the US, but there are other markets that can always uh, intervene or still trade with us depending on whatever political position we take. So that's why we believe that any a political position you take, there will be economic consequences. I mean, if we were to read the EFF policies, if you were to implement those policies, you ought to conscientize society and make society aware that there will be consequences for such a political decision. But a decision had to be taken and, and position must be taken and that position was going to be taken if we're in charge of our international policy. We're in conversation with the president of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Julius Malema. Remember to continue this conversation on Twitter where we'll try to take some of your comments using the hashtag Malema on Unfiltered. And don't go anywhere because the conversation continues after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. I'm in conversation with EFF President Julius Malema. Mr. Malema, let's come to some more domestic questions. Yeah. I've been listening very closely to your recent statements. And one of them is that you're dissatisfied with the energy and the intensity of some of your own representatives in South African legislatures. What are you going to do to ensure that EFF members who are actually voted in by the people of South Africa discharge their duties, attend meetings, and do the thing that voters sent them to do? Well, uh, we have to strengthen our caucuses, both in parliament and legislatures, including uh, municipalities. Um, it's very simple, Caesar. You just say to a member of parliament, send me the questions you have sent to the minister from January until now. Uh, send me the, the uh, statements you have made in public about the department that you are sitting in the committee of and uh, the inputs you have made both in the plenary and in the committees from January until now. And you find a person has not said anything, has not submitted anything. and So such people, you will, you will have to ask them to recuse themselves. But why hasn't that happened why has that been allowed to happen? No, no, when remember that has, when you have... When the EFF are, came, came, came on the scene as a party which said we're going to be different from the ANC, we're going to wake the ANC up from its sleep, yeah. is the EFF now falling into Never. a sleep? Not when we're there. That's why when you've got your central committee meetings, that's where you do continuous assessment and you say this is the conclusion we came to and that continuous assessment helps you to make an intervention as it were, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, but we have not fallen into sleep. We're still the most vibrant party uh, in Parliament in South Africa. Uh, we still have our own uh, 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 members of Parliament taking the authorities head on. But there will be those elements that you need to deal with to bring the party into what it's supposed to be. Well, there's still some vibrancy when there are a lot of cameras on the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, it does seem to be quite a serious problem when you look into the details of committee work. I was checking records of parliamentary attendance. Yeah. I looked at mm -hmm. the Rules Committee, obviously very important because of the way the EFF is dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, no attendance in two recent meetings from either of the EFF representatives. Higher education very important question of free education. Mm -hmm. Again, no attendance from the two representatives at the two most recent meetings and human, human settlements, housing. So it seems at committee meetings where the rubber hits the road of parliamentary oversight, EFF MPs are not, not only just sleeping, they're actually not there. No, uh, sleeping is not even an option. There's no sleeping. That's why I'm happy you're agreeing with me. You are able to isolate certain committees and say there was no full participation uh, in the past two uh, committees or so. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. And, and we are the ones who brought this to the fore and said there are these things that we may want to attend to in the immediate. Uh, we agree with you entirely that there will be pockets, but uh, the vibrancy is there. You go into Scopa 
uh, you find our national chairperson there, you go into correctional service, best that you go into international relations. Our comrades, and what gives me even more interest uh, is that it's females who are leading the charge, who are having an impact uh, on what the EFF is doing in Parliament. So there will be here and there, and, and I'm happy you mentioned education because the higher education is one of the uh, areas we identified that it looks like uh, there is no full participation there, and we may want to zoom uh, into that space. So uh, 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 I raised that, so I have no reason to, to argue differently about it. I'm, I raised that, and I raised it in public because in the EFF we believe in a constructive uh, self-criticism and also to be accountable to the people who have elected us. We don't have to hide anything uh, from our people here. Yeah. You sit on the Constitutional Review Committee, I believe. I don't sit as in well. any committee except uh, uh, um, the one that did the Ethics Committee. And the Section 194 yes. Committee. Yes. That is not a committee. Uh, that special, inquiry of the... Special uh, inquiry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you think your attendance has been a model for the committees that you are on, have been on, for other leaders? Well, the party. Uh, I, I sit in ethics, I do my work there. In the 174, uh, I sit with the uh, Treasurer General of the EFF. Imagine just two senior of us. So uh, she's been very effective there. I will be charged with other organizational responsibilities. But the EFF in that committee has never been absent. What about local councils and local municipalities? What is being done to rein in some of the councillors who aren't attending meetings, aren't being as energetic as you and the EFF have professed to be? What can be done about the local government level? No, we need to get the deployees who are deployed in the provinces there from national and provinces to make sure that EFF has have caucus meetings before the council. Then take a position and say to the councillors, go and execute this position of the EFF. Most of our councillors are relatively new people into politics. And without the necessary guidance from the leadership, they are going to think they are doing something right, only to find that they are offending the system. So we should take full responsibility ourselves to ensure that councils uh, EFF caucuses sit, decisions are taken, and those decisions are executed. I'm one person who, when I make an observation on a particular council or a province that the EFF is not making a serious impact, I will reach out and say to the comrades who are deployed there, but I'm not impressed with one, two, three, four, and you must go and support those comrades uh, at that level. Of course, local government is not just about this attendance and being energetic and holding power to account, but it's also about the coalition dynamics which yes. have captured the imagination of our country. And I think it's fair to say the EFF has been playing a role of centrality mm -hmm. in many metros, many municipalities in our country. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, you're part of a cooperative agreement for governance. Mm -hmm with the ANC, at least in places like Twane mm -hmm. and Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have said you're not in any relationship with the ANC. I mean, which, which one is it? Because you certainly seem to be in a relationship with them, at least in some places, even if not with others. None. Well, not the, the, so the question, which one is which one, doesn't arise because none. Uh, we're not. Uh, you just use the word agreement. We're not in agreement with anyone, both verbal and written. We believe that local government should be based on uh, tangible issues, service delivery issues. If the DA was to pass, push a motion that uh, there is a problem of sewer in Ikruleni, in Tembisa, in this area, we are saying this must be attended to with immediate effect we raise our hand to support that motion, then we should be asked the question, where do you stand? We stand with service delivery. But, we but don't stand with political in, parties. In places, in places that I've mentioned, yeah. a few others, it's not just a question of voting for a motion. 
it's actually voting for it's, mayor. It's a coalition. No, it's, it's, it's not. a coalition. If you define a coalition as a temporary political agreement to elect a government into power, that's what a coalition no. is. And that's no, what I agree, the FF has, I agree, I agree has with been you. doing. I agree with you. But that's what the FF has no, no, been doing in, in various go, places in South Africa. You go into Gurleni, and then they put two guys who are contesting for the position of the mayor. You look at who's the best guy and vote for that person without any agreement with anyone. But you know it's the same as the motion ANC of the MMCs suit. Will, huh? You know that the government that will be formed, not just the mayor, but the government around that person, will include ANC people as MMCs in that government, and you'll have to cooperate with them. Uh, no, 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 they're, in invite, they're invited by the mayor. They're not invited by us. We don't appoint any MMC of the ANC. We didn't appoint any MMC of PA in Johannesburg. They're invited by the mayor. So you can't uh, have it both ways. You're going to say to the mayor, you appointed these people, and then come say to the EFF, we appointed these people. No, there ought to be someone who have appointed the MMCs. We were invited by the mayor in Jobek and in Ikrulin, in Morali City, in Westrand, we accepted. And whoever else the mayor invites is his business. When invited, we shall execute our mandate to the best of our ability. And when the other MMCs who come from other parties, if they dare misbehave or engage in corrupt activities, we're going to call them out. Why? Because we have no agreement with them. The same goes to the mayor. If a mayor misbehaves and gets in corrupt activities, we'll call him out because we have no agreement with anyone. So we're not bound by anything. As we don't have anything. But, so those things of temporary government and all of that is binding on you guys who have come together and reached some sort form of agreement. We have no such uh, with the ANC and we are not in agreement, in any agreement with the ANC. We voted for a mayor uh, in Gurleni. He invited us who are participating. We voted for a mayor in Jobek. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the ANC supported the same idea. Uh, so we're fine. Uh, we're okay. Let's, let's continue this conversation after the break. Remember to use the hashtag Malema on Unfiltered and we round off this conversation with the president of the EFF, Julius Malema. Don't go anywhere for our final segment. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're in conversation with Julius Malema, the president of the Economic Freedom Fighters. Mr. Malema, the Moonshot Pact was announced by John Stian Hazen. Would you rule out in 2024 when you may hold the balance of power working with the DA to form an opposition government? Well, we are in opposition. The first people who you reach out to is opposition parties when such an opportunity comes. And uh, we wouldn't hesitate to talk to the DA, to the Freedom Front, to anyone in the opposition benches, but we'll put our blueprint on the ground and say this is what we want in this coalition because we don't just go into coalitions uh, for positions. The first thing we need to agree on is the issues that are fundamental uh, to the EFF and negotiations are about give and take uh, and, and that's what we'll present. On uh, those party stances if... on, especially on the national level, yeah. not, not yeah. in terms of local coalitions, I mean the Freedom Front Plus, so far from everything the EFF stands for, that that might be a step too far. I mean, isn't Furvut's grandson or something you, 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 a member saying, of the Freedom Front saying, Plus? you uh, what, national? Nationally. Yes, we will give the national Freedom Front uh, the uh, land expropriation without compensation. Uh, we will not do those things of Furvut. They will say, yeah, let's go and expropriate land and give it to the people. If they agree, that is what the, we want. That's what we stand for. We will go with them. We. At the, at the center of whatever is going to happen in 2024 is going to be seven non-negotiable cardinal pillars uh, of the EFF. And that's what we did even with local government. That's why we ended up not having any coalition partner. One of the reasons I was asking you about the coalition arrangement mm. in certain metros is some people fear that just as the ANC loses its majority, mm. the EFF will bring the ANC through the back door 
in 2024 and subject South Africans to more ANC government when they've rejected the ANC for the first time. That would be a very difficult place for the EFF to be in, to have campaigned for nearly a decade against ANC misrule, and then when the ANC loses power, to bring them back in. Coalition means no one won. So anyone can govern. So it's a reality we have to deal with. Because this thing that when people didn't win elections, and then you see, yeah, they rejected this one. Okay, they rejected this one in favor of which one? So we are not going to bring the ANC through a back door. We are going to bring a radical policy of the EFF through the front door. Because anyone who's going to go with the EFF in the coalition after 2024 election, we have to expropriate South Africa's land and redistribute it to our people. We ought to nationalize the mines. We have to establish uh, our own state-owned bank. So we're almost there. I mean, the ANC just missed it by inch. You know, I saw uh, Bulela Ninguka who was in the negotiation team with the EFF on the national, Bulela Ninguka agreeing that, yes, ANC accept expropriation of land without compensation as a condition within which we're going into this coalition with. You know who rejected it? A young man called Ronald Lamola against Bulela Ninguka, which we thought is going to give us a difficult time. We were almost expropriating this land. And that's what the EFF does. We, we were at the, at the verge of great, getting a positive deal, which was going to get our people land. So we don't want the ANC through a back door. We want land. Will what the EFF do after 2024 deliver the land? If the answer is yes, let those partners come and let's deliver the land to our people. You're going to have a very difficult choice because there's, there's a serious possibility that you will be the party capable of deciding who the national government we're is. We're going to be number one. If we're not number one, we're number two. That's why well, DA declares us an enemy well, you said because that, their own internal you said that research. In, in all elections. No, no. We're never declared an enemy number one in all the elections were declared an enemy number one now because the internal research of the DA told them the EFF has passed you. That's, That's true, why we're an enemy. It's, so, it's unlikely the EFF is going to win the election. Let's, let's be honest. You are being unscientific now. You are, you are being religious. The, poll, you, you, the polls no, are very no, it's not, it's, it's not The polls is not the elections. Allow the people to go and vote. So what is the point, CISO, if of going to elections if CISO already has the results? So... We are going to the elections. We are campaigning very hard to get the state power and use the state power to deliver the socialist program of the EFF. And we will shock you uh, in 2024. Uh, our people are tired of what is happening and they need change. And that change is the EFF. I think the, the question for me is, assume that doesn't happen. Yeah. And the DA leads a coalition on one side and the ANC holds the balance of power on another side. Mm. And you say to the ANC, we want expropriation without compensation. And the ANC says no. Yeah. And the DA, then you go to them and say, we want expropriation without compensation. And they say no. Then we could be in a situation where we have an unstable, either you have to choose one, or we could have a minority government, yes. which would be if we look at the instability of minority governments in metros, we could be plunged into a situation where we have a different president as often as we've had Joburg mayors. <laughs> That's why we must decide in 2024. The voters must decide what they want in 2024. The, the metros have shown us uh, what undecisiveness does to government. So we need to come out in our numbers and we need to vote and vote for a party that will bring change. So I'm not going to, you know, we once had a discussion with President Ramaphosa when he came in and we said in this discussion, no one must speak about positions, especially you as a president and a typical ANC leader. He couldn't hold himself. At the end, he was offering us positions and we said, we're not here for that. We're here for policy positions 
of this is what we think you need to do when you take over. And that's what we did with local government. That's what we're going to do. And Mbalula speaks about it uh, in one of the lectures he gave. He says, Floyd gave us seven points, gave cardinal points, and said if we don't meet them, uh, he's not going to vote for us. It's, it's correct. That's how we operate. If you don't meet us halfway, why should we go in? For what? If it's not a personal gratification, if it's not position mongering, uh, just, just to be called ministers, ministers to do what? And uh, if there is a minority government, it will not be of EFF's creation. It will be out of the indecisiveness of the people of South Africa. We have a chance next year. Let's go and take a decision of what we want to do with this country. In terms of the election, of course, policy is going to be a key question. Yes. And I guess one question is, is the EFF's policy set of proposals actually attracting voters? It's, it's attracted a certain number, mm -hmm. up to the 12, maybe 15 percent mark. But is it actually slowing down in some places? So we see in by-elections in the Eastern Cape, some in Bumalanga, actually not the story of the EFF progressing, but actually in some ways reversing. Is the EFF's policy proposal offering to South Africa not igniting people's imagination enough? Well, uh, you ought to have a, a principle you stand on. Uh, and uh, uh, whether you call us flip-floppers or not, this is who we are. And if you go down the history of some of us as individuals who have stood for these things for time in memoria, uh, uh, and uh, if that is not attractive enough to the voters, unfortunately, that's who we are. Um, we can't do anything. If we are ugly, we're born like this. Uh, and therefore, if you're not interested in us, and it, that's what it is. So, uh, uh, and it's not correct that the EFF has slowed down anyway. The EFF is the only political party in South Africa that grows. And the rest of other political parties are declining. And, uh, 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 and that tells you that you are attracting people. You know, with the kind of policy position we are advocating for, it will need us to conscientize society politically. Uh, and uh, uh, to conscientize society is not something that is going to happen overnight. It's something that will take a bit of time. And the EFF should be on the ground. Because our policies are so radical, so much that people can vote us today and uh, to, uh, protest against us the following day if they are not properly conscientized and canvassed on these radical uh, positions of uh, uh, the EFF. So from where I'm sitting, we're doing very well. So far, so good in terms of the EFF. I want to take some comments from social media sure. because many people have been using the hashtag Malema on Unfiltered. And let's see what you have to say. Ngonde says, my answer is a big no to whether we should entrust our future to Julius Malema. You can't trust this guy. He doesn't have any backbone. Today he's saying this and the following day contradicting himself of what he was saying the previous day. So how can you trust such a person? We have Slotternet. The CIC is, is tried and tested and has got the leadership capacity to lead South Africa to a prosperous future. Siwela says he sounds promising, but EFF's policies related to land are a one-way ticket to chaos, sanctions, tribalism, and civil war. And let's see if we have one more. I think that's the last one because we want to make sure we squeeze in as much as we can. How do you respond to particularly some of the critical comments there? There is this view in South African society that You've adopted many different positions at different times. The moniker, the label of flip-flopper has been placed on you. Are you a flip-flopper? Do you, do you blow with the political wind wherever it goes, whenever it's convenient? I create the wind. So I can't go with the wind. I am the wind. I create the political wind in South Africa and therefore cannot go with a certain wind. Uh, the flip-flopper is a title given to me by my enemies and why should I worry about what my enemies think of me 
go to free education, go to land, go to nationalization. Go. Those are the policies uh, of the EFF. Can I, can In I mention... politics, there is what we call tactics uh, and, and strategy. So uh, at sometimes you have to kiss many frogs in order to arrive at your strategic objective. Sure, but I think the flip-flopping actually, and quite interestingly, is not necessarily on policy, although yeah. there are some policy questions we could cover, but it's actually on people. So whether that's former President Zuma, who in many ways, whose career you virtually ended, then there seems to be a, a, a honeymoon there. Judge Trope, who you criticized, castigated, really diminished his standing in society, but then supported. We've mentioned Brian Mulefe, Nkosa Zana Lamini Zuma. So it seems that depending on where the political, the political dynamics are, you will praise in, in glowing terms or criticize harshly any person at any time, no matter the cost. Let's, let's, let's go to the example of what you opened with here about Nkosa Zan. I said Nkosa Zana must go and raise their hand in parliament uh, to, so that we can see where she stands. Then when I arrive in parliament, I get confronted by colleagues in the opposition and the police that there are people who received death threats. When I said Nkosa Zana must raise her hand, there was no death threat. I must still insist that she must raise her hand, even when the dynamics tell me now that her life is at risk. So we, we must not be uh, foolish to that extent. Uh, there's no flip-flopping there. That's what I'm saying to the speaker. There's a new evidence. Police have come to collect statements. People's lives are in danger. And therefore, uh, the issue of hands will no longer work, given this development. So politics are not static. What about they, the they, others? They President moved. Zuma, Judge Chope, No, President Brian Zuma, Malefe. you know, the highest form of punishment you can give to a president is to make sure he doesn't finish his uh, term of office. And we, we did exactly that. That is the end of it. Why do you want to follow him to the grave? Why? To achieve what? I've achieved my mission with President Zuma. It's done. So I'm not going to pursue President Zuma to the grave. And uh, it is not in my nature to pursue old men like that and even take him to prison without trial. It, it's unfair politically. My issue with President Zuma was political. And that political differences has been ironed out. Why must I still pursue President Zuma to impress who? It's done. So it's not flip-flopping. Did I achieve what I wanted to achieve? I did. So... But my enemy that understands very well what I mean, deliberately try to distort my message so that right. I remain this monster in the eyes of the people. But it is for me, through a period of time and my involvement in politics, to demonstrate that I'm not what these people are saying. And this 10 years gives us that track record. Julius Malema, thank you for joining us on Unfiltered. Thank you very much.